This leadership quote number five assignment provides an opportunity to create a video about the person that I believe personifies what it is to be a leader. Following hours of research, I selected General Benjamin Oliver Davis Jr. as the person, in my opinion, that personifies what it is to be a leader. With the goal of providing answers to the questions, a project drew from several of John C. Maxwell's 21 irrefutable laws of leadership for examples. It is my sincere hope that in viewing this video, you will learn more about General Davis's contributions and what makes him such a great leader. Benjamin Oliver Davis Jr. was the fourth African-American to graduate from the United States Military Academy in 1936. General Benjamin O. Davis Jr., you are the best of America. He's a great warrior, a great officer, and a great American. Benjamin L. Davis Jr. came from a military family. His father, Benjamin L. Davis Sr., joined the U.S. Army in 1898 during the Spanish-American War as an enlisted soldier. Then Ben Davis Sr. becoming the first black general in United States history, and then him paving the way and understanding the military, and then Ben Davis Jr. coming up through West Point, something that he, his dad was not able to do. And he was so thrilled to be here. But within the first day, when he roomed alone as an African-American, he realized something was different. That would just make West Point 10 times harder for, for anybody. Back in those days, he was silenced because of his race. And now we're at a place where we celebrate diversity in the Corps. And that's something that we need to always remember. After he graduated, he did so well in his career and had so many different accomplishments and made history. So I think if cadets are able to keep that in the back of their minds and remember that he can make it through, then it'll allow them to push through as well. At the time that he entered the military, the military wasn't training African Americans to fly. And so he had to go above and beyond to, to get that training and to become a pilot. Benjamin O. Davis Jr., because of his experience at West Point and also at Fort Benning, knew to achieve and to succeed was through hard work, dedication, and near perfection. They had to be professionals. And so he, though a, a wonderful officer, and a good, kind man was also a very strong stalwart when it comes to leadership. He did not tolerate mistakes and unacceptable behavior. He commanded the Tuskegee Airmen, and he went to bat for them at times when folks were saying, African Americans can't fly, they can't fight as well as, as white pilots. He was back in D.C. lobbying, arguing, fighting for his airmen because he had flown with them, he had fought with them, he knew what they could do. When it came time for the services to integrate, Benjamin O. Davis was on the cutting edge of Air Force integration. He commanded the 13th Air Force. He was the first African American to command a numbered Air Force. conditions will allow for a more thoughtful approach. Where are you going? To give a representative of the accused an opportunity to defend himself. We don't need to learn this. I don't think this is from his gentleman. General Stevenson, you know, this is Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, the commanding officer of the squadron in question. Be seated. Colonel, you are aware of the accusations, uh, such as malaise and fatigue in the face of little enemy contact? We've been in continuous combat for months with no replacements, sir. My men are tired. Other units get four fresh bodies a month. 
but something always seems to go wrong with our paperwork or movement orders. How many missions have your men flown, Colonel? Most have flown well over 50, which is the standard cutoff point at which white pilots are sent home. And your men are still flying? They don't know what else to do with us, sir. White pilots rotate back to the States as instructors. But since the Army won't allow colored pilots to train white cadets... Nine months training. Countless missions in Africa. And not one air-to-air -air kill. Isn't that right? We can't fight what we don't see. We've been stationed so far from frontline action, we rarely encounter an enemy plane, let alone the opportunity to engage one. You recently lost a pilot who cut and ran from, what, an imaginary message man. Those men understand Lieutenant Cappy's action was a mistake. Stakes are all we see, young man. Late for mission briefings, piss poor discipline and leadership, and nothing but excuses. What I see is a unit that's an embarrassment to the Air Corps, to the American people, and to themselves. Might I remind you, gentlemen, that this war is by no means won, and this sad experiment is a drain and a hindrance to that effort. My vote is that we abandon the project and move the agenda. All we asked for was a chance to prove ourselves, a fair and impartial opportunity. We thought we had that chance. But you invite us to a poker game, hand us a fixed deck, and then wonder why we can't win? Young man, we really don't... Let him finish, sir. Every colored pilot in the 99th went to his own private hell to wear those wings. Every one of those men carry not only the burden of their dreams of becoming American military aviators, but the hopes of an entire people as well. Am I the only one in this room that understands just what that means? I was brought up to believe that, beneath it all, Americans are a decent people with an abiding sense of integrity and fair play. The cheers I heard across this country when Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens humiliated Hitler's master race didn't just come from proud colored folks. They came from everyone. How are we to interpret that? As a United States Army officer who gladly puts his life on the line every day, there's no greater conflict within me. How do I feel about my country? And how does my country feel about me? Are we only to be Americans when the mood suits you? A fair and impartial opportunity is all we ask. Nothing that you yourselves wouldn't demand. His last duty assignment was he was the vice commander of Strike Command. In 1970, after 34 years of active duty, four years at the academy, he retired as a three-star general. He took a position, a senior position, in the Department of Transportation. Many of us who were alive back then will remember when the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit law was enacted in 1974. That was his idea. So he served with the Transportation Department for a few years, and then he retired. Just like West Point says in its mission statement, he was committed to a lifetime of service to the nation. He never looked back. He never looked back and said, I was poorly treated while I was at the academy. I had troubles here, I had troubles there. He always looked forward. He continues to show us the importance of duty, honor, and country. As cliche as that may sound, he embodied every pillar that the United States Military Academy and the Air Force wants to show and employ. Yeah, when I think of General Davis, um, I mean, I'm just honored and moved by his uh, dedication, his strength, his fortitude, his ability to rise above uh, his, his circumstances and um, continue to excel and be a great light for future officers, uh, including myself. Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. 
American. That's what he thought of himself as, an American. He wanted to be remembered for his merit rather than his color. One word to describe General Davis would be a pioneer. Tenacity. Resilience. Great courage. Determination. Excellence. Perseverance. Commitment. If I had to describe General Davis in one word, I think that word would be overwhelming. Because when we look at him and we think about him and what he accomplished in his life and whether our efforts are going to measure up, you know, for him to be proud of us, uh, it's overwhelming. And this happens to be a picture that we had set up uh, this is a photo of him when he got his uh, fourth star. President Clinton appointed him as a, a four-star general in his retirement. Today, we advance to the rank of four-star general Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., a hero in war, a leader in peace, a pioneer for freedom, opportunity, and basic human dignity. But general Davis is here today as living proof that a person can overcome adversity and discrimination, achieve great things, turn skeptics into believers, and that through example and perseverance, one person can bring truly extraordinary change. And so the idea of naming the new cadet barracks after Davis is just an incredible opportunity to inspire the cadets to inspire generations uh, in the future of what this individual did, contributed, and achieved during his life. Of all the names that they started with when the process began of who would they name the building after um, and who signified the future and whose name um, would we integrate into the lexicon of the entire academy, and when it came down to one name and they selected Benjamin O. Davis Jr., I, <laughs> it was the happiest moment. I, I, I couldn't even believe it. And then seeing it for the first time, it, it's awe-inspiring, so. When I look at General Davis and I look at that building, I said, that is, that is greatness personified. So not, we not only have a picture of him, but we have something to stare at every single day. Not only does it celebrate the man Davis, but it's, it's up above some of the other barracks, just like Davis would have been when he was in his P-51 Mustang. Davis Barracks is soaring up above some of the other barracks in the academy. Ben would just have been elated. Uh, he would have been very honored, felt very honored, but very humble about it. I just wish he... I just, just wish he could have seen it. That would have been his whole life. And a fitting end to it.